Hey gang, today we are in Toledo, Ohio, and we are at Woodlawn Cemetery here, historic Woodlawn, and we're going to be talking about the story of a boy named Clay Hopper. It was 1892 in December when he passed away, 18 years old, buried alive, but not quite. But it's one of these stories, well, it's kind of. I don't, you'll have to hear the story, but it's one of those stories, as they always say, too crazy to make up. This is the one. And we get into medical science. We get into some quackery. It, it's twists and turns, and, 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 and the end here is going to have kind of a twist to it. And I've got to give a shout out to Deb who we've done a lot of work and research on the story from the archives and also the Lucas Department of Health locating graves. Rachel there, thank you. She gave me some leads which led me to an amazing woman, Michelle, at the Bowling Green Jerome Library. We're working together and I'll tell you at the end as we get to the end as we're walking here where this is all going but you've got to hear the story. I'm going to read from the newspaper of the time as we walk along here of Clay Hopper, like I said, it was December of 1892 when this happened. I mean, he, he had a weak heart. He was not a healthy young man, but he was very religious. The family was very religious and he was hardworking. I mean, he worked various jobs. He was a cash boy and clerk at the local store one of the big stores at the time, Lamson Brothers. And yeah, in December of 1892, he was thought to have died of dropsy of the heart, as they called it back then. However, after the funeral, just before he was buried, wait till you hear this, I'm gonna tell you what happens. I mean, the doctors, it wasn't even the doctors, it was the parents, they saw signs of life. So let's go to the newspaper and let's go to the Watertown News. Wednesday, January 25th, 1893 came out later. And it starts with the headline of the death of Clay Hopper. Toledo's remarkable case of suspended animation. All that is earthly of Clay G. Hopper is now resting in the vault in Woodlawn Cemetery in Toledo, Ohio. And I'll just mention, by the way, the vault, you know, when they talk about the vault, we're talking about the, the public vaults. In those days, they wouldn't bury in the winter. You know, in these climates, the grounds were f frozen and you'd have these common huge vaults where it was common at the big cemeteries and they would keep all the bodies in there frozen until spring and then you can excavate and bury them. So they would all collect. Now the vault isn't here anymore. I did check with the cemetery because that is one place that is going to play very key to this story as you will see as I continue to read this article. Owing to the hurried burial preparations, the grave was not ready and for a month at least then the body will remain in the vault. Clay Hopper was 18. He had never enjoyed perfect health throughout his childhood. He was pale and sickly, but he was remarkably precocious. He attended the city schools when well enough and was always in far advance of pupils of like age. He was deeply interested in religious matters. His parents and himself were members of St. Paul's Methodist Episcopal Church here, the most prominent of that faith in Toledo. He was always a prominent factor in other church societies and his purity of conduct was so noticeable as to cause comment. The physician said the disease which held him within its grasp was dropsy of the pericardium. He gradually failed until Friday, December 29th. He was pronounced dead by Dr. J.D. Sickles, the family physician. 
and the good standing physician he was. Family sent for undertaker F.R. Bennett, who also declared Clay to be dead. So he prepared the body for burial and placed it in a handsome casket. The funeral was set for the following Sunday. Reverend S.D. Huston Pillar, pastor of St. Paul's, preached an eloquent sermon, and it was a very impressive funeral. The souring relatives and church officials were preparing to follow the remains to Woodlawn here. The grave had been dug in the frozen earth. So actually they, I'm gonna interject here, they actually weren't waiting. It must've been just early enough to get the grave in the ground before the frost really set in. Maybe it was a warm December, but that said, he was in the vault. All was ready to start here at the funeral when there came a halt. The parents declared that they could not consciously permit their boy to be laid in the cold ground until they were fully satisfied that he was dead. They could give no reason, no reason for thinking Clay might still be living, only a vague premonition that he might be. Well, the mourners and the hearse were dismissed and Dr. Sickles was sent for, and he came. He tried every test commonly used and declared that the youth was dead as he ever would be. To satisfy the parents, however, he did call in nearly all the leading physicians of this city here in Toledo and nearly all of them declared that the boy was lifeless, except for one or two refusing to commit themselves. They based their doubt on the fact that the lips were pink. Clay's lips were pink. The body had not become rigid, and there was no indication of decomposition. The first evidence that the parents' doubts were well-founded was obtained on the following Friday when Mrs. Hopper tied a cord around one of her son's fingers. After a while, a little bunch gathered just below it, indicating that blood had gathered there upon the circulation being cut off. When she removed the string, the lump disappeared. Then the nostrils turned to a pinkish hue and a slight perspiration broke out on the forehead. These symptoms were explained to the doctors who declared, oh, it must be merely the result of muscular contraction and decomposition. Of course, the doctors know better, right? No odor was perceptible, however, save that of the undertaker's drugs. Now I'll stop here. I can't imagine he was embalmed, but he may, be, he may have been partially embalmed, which, which makes this story even crazier. But again, it says no odor was perceptible, however, save that of the undertaker's drugs. Although the room where the casket stood was kept at about 72 degrees temperature. The next day, the youth's face became still more lifelike and his hands became quite warm. The hopes of the family were strengthened and the parents continued their supplications to God. Sunday evening about dusk, Clay opened his right eye and he closed it again. The pupil, it was bright, not glassy. His breast heaved several times, enough to be perceptible. And by holding one's ear over the heart, a faint fluttering could be heard. Well, the news quickly spread all over the city. And since then, the case has been the subject of conversation all over town. Dr. J. L. Gallagher, 
a physician whose specialty is magnetic healing was then given charge of the case. And this is the part where you just have to shake your head and listen to this. I mean, you have to figure they got rid of Dr. Sickles and the other doctors like, you guys don't even know what you're doing. Our son's alive. Then they bring in this crazy, now this is where the quackery starts. Wait till you hear this. Medicine of magnetism. Have you ever heard about that? Well, he came in and he took the body of clay from the casket and laid him on a mattress. That's right. Then he covered that with warm bed clothing and they rubbed brandy all over the supposed corpse and applied that to the lips. What happened? Well, it was quickly absorbed through the pores and the flesh turned to and color in spots. And there were other evidences of life. Now we're cooking. Dr. Gallagher then applied a theory he had held that invalids who were of magnetic temperament could impart animal magnetism to others. Here's where it really gets weird. He selected Mrs. Benzine, MD, a Mrs. Channing White, E.G. Archibald, and J.H. Eberth, to grasp the hands of the dead and all formed a circuit. Almost like a seance. Mrs. White was highly nervous. The result that Clay's hands twitched several times and he opened his eyes and closed them. His heart fluttered. They could hear it frequently and the breast heaved slightly on three or four occasions. As a final test, Dr. Gallagher applied a hypodermic injection. <laughs> That's right, a big needle. And it was slowly carried away, proving conclusively that the blood was in circulation. At the bedside all night was Barney Baldwin. This is the man with the broken neck who exhibits himself in the museums. He says he was almost buried when in a trance following a railroad accident in Alabama where he broke his neck. They almost buried him alive, he said. He seized Hopper's hands last night when the arms suddenly turned cold and black. Dr. Gallagher thinks Baldwin is possessed of magnetism similar to that of Hopper, whereas only an opposite kind will be of assistance. You know, like opposite ends of a magnet. Wow, so preposterous. Well, it goes on to conclude the signs of life became visible Saturday. The hands and feet and head moved and the eyes opened and closed. The body was warm. And at one time, a feeble groan escaped the sleeper. Breath was also detected more with the looking glass. The movements continued until Thursday at midnight, but then it seemed that death claimed its feeble victim. The first unfavorable symptoms became noticeable Wednesday when signs of decomposition were visible around the blue spots, which were produced by the application of electricity, electricity to test for death. This spread gradually, and when the body was thoroughly examined by Dr. Gardner, this was on Thursday, he was fearful that death would take place that day. And back to Dr. Gallagher, it is his firm belief that if the case could have received proper treatment from the first, the boy would have recovered, recovered his usual health.
That's right, he, he died then. And a little headline from the Toledo paper on January 13th, Clay Hopper is dead. The young man who has been lying in so-called trance for the past two weeks after having his funeral sermon preached is finally dead. Decomposition set in yesterday in places where electricity had been applied in the hope of reviving him, and today the family, family has given up all hope. The case has been a very remarkable one and created a great deal of interest among all classes here. Well, that is the end of the story of Clay Hopper. Now we're walking here in the old section and the cemetery in the research that I've done, they say his father removed him and then Michelle with the library did find documentation of that in February of 1893. I guess the next year, well, only a month or two later, right? Did disinter, they buried him here and then they disinterred him. Now, we are on the hunt. So this is where Clay was in suspended animation. He was here on the grounds, very near here, in that community vault. And just think, probably for several days, no food, no water, no care. He's still alive, so they really, they really blew it, those doctors. But you know, that was medicine back then. It was really bad. So what we are going to do is we're going to go from here down south to this other cemetery. And that is where his mom is. And I'm not sure I can find his grave. No one's answering with the city. I think it's called Woodsville. No help there. Several calls. But we're going to go there, and we are going to see if we can find her, and I'll bet he might be there. All right, let's go. Okay, gang, we are about a half hour south, southeast in Woodville, at the Woodville Cemetery. We found Clay's father, Benjamin Hopper. I'm pretty sure it's him. And I think he was a veteran. He's got a veteran stone. And we've got a gravel plant over there. It's going to be a little noisy, but otherwise very well-maintained cemetery here. His mother is here. Lydia couldn't find her grave. She doesn't appear to be with her husband, but she's here probably with... I found some other hoppers, couldn't find her. But I will follow up to see if Clay, they didn't call me back, so I will follow up. And at the end of this video episode, I will put a note in if we find Clay. But chances are he's here because he was disinterred within a month or two up there at Woodlawn. Why? Because grave robbing was rampant in this area and Indiana and up north in Michigan, they were stealing bodies like crazy in those days. And with all the publicity that this case got, you know the grave robbers were at the ready, the resurrectionists, to get Clay over to the anatomist. So I am betting he's unmarked. He was unmarked. But the cemetery should have the records here if he's here. It's not at Woodlawn. So we'll see what we can find out. But let's, let's walk to Benjamin's grave and hopefully through working with the village here, talk to somebody that has the cemetery records, they're going to know, they're going to know where Lydia is and if possibly if Clay is here. I'm saying chances are 80% that he is here because both parents are here, right? He was disinterred, where else would they put him? So look around people. And I'm gonna tell you something, this buried alive thing you're only going to find out the story if someone has been dug up, buried alive. And when, why would you dig a body back up? You, you put them in the grave, you say your prayers, you come visit, you give them flowers, and you don't, you don't come back and dig them up unless mom has some crazy premonition and maybe even not then. 
So what I'm going to tell you is based on that and based on what we know, at every cemetery there are people that were probably buried alive in the 1800s, including here. Maybe it's five people, maybe it's one person, but I can guarantee you the odds are there are, and we'll never know, because why would you dig them up? There's no reason to dig them up. And right now the coffins, you know, these were wood coffins in those days. Those wood coffins are all part of the earth. They're part of the ground. The only thing surviving, like Frank True said, one of our friends that, because he's moved graves and stuff from the 1800s, is you'll see the heel, the heels of the shoes, the rubber. That's the only thing that survives. Maybe some brown bones, not much. So that's kind of the deal. I'm never going to know who was buried alive, but there's a lot of people who were buried alive. So here is the grave of Benjamin Hopper. And twenty first Ohio Infantry. And if you check the dates, they line up on find a grave. He's on find a grave. So this has got to be him. This has got to be him. All right. Lydia's here somewhere. Maybe she's here, right here, unmarked. And Clay, too. So we'll see what we can find out. But a crazy story from the late 1800s. And that'll do it for today. Rest in peace to the hoppers. Thank you.